All right, so chapter 10 um, looks at, uh, from a human resources perspective and a business perspective, right? How do you motivate and satisfy employees? And um, uh, both individually and in teams. And so we're gonna be looking at a few aspects of this in this chapter. A lot of it actually is, um, if you've taken a psychology course before, some of this stuff is gonna look very familiar. Um, so first off, uh, what is motivation, right? Well, it just, it's the root, you know, the root word motivation, you can look at motive, right? So what causes you to act? What exactly prompts you to, to do something? That's a motive. So motivation is whatever internal process that goes on in you, right? That energizes you and gets you to move and do things and get things done and behave in a particular way and things like that. Um, you know what might motivate you personally. It might be um, getting together with friends. Uh, it might be doing certain activities with friends. Uh, it might be, you know, going to work and make some money. It might be, you know, um, uh, you know, anything really, I mean, can motivate people to do things. Uh, so how, how do businesses use all of that information to their benefit for employees? Uh, what is also very, very important too is what's the morale on the job? So how do employees feel about the job that they're doing, their employer, their supervisor, et cetera? Um, because that morale is also part of what's happening in, uh, inside of you, right? Part of that internal process. Um, and so if your morale isn't very good because you don't feel good about your job or you don't feel good about your supervisor or whatnot, well, that's going to drain that energy. That's going to drain those uh, very important processes inside of you that get you to get things done right, for the company and for yourself. Um, but if that morale is very high because you have very strong, good feelings about your job, about your employer, your, your supervisor, you feel is supportive and understanding and, and fair, um, well, then that creates a, a, a good motivation for you that helps morale on the job and it increases satisfaction. And it's the wonderful thing about morale is, you know, it's catchy. If you're happy at work, if you're doing a good job, chances are uh, you might be influencing other people to do the same thing. And of course, the opposite is also true. That negative drain, that negativity also brings other people down uh, with it. And so, you know, morale is really, really important in general. It all started with uh, this guy, uh, Frederick Taylor. Um, Frederick Taylor uh, really is considered the father, the father of scientific management because he was the guy who actually looked at how workers were working. He observed them, he documented step by step what they were doing, um, and he basically came up with a few systems. One of the systems he came up with was uh, the piece rate system. Uh, and this meant that, you know, uh, compensate uh, people based on the amount of work that they do, right, on the actual output of what they produce. Um, and because they're getting paid per piece, that's the piece rate, per piece of, of whatever output they're, they're doing, um, they'll be motivated to make more of those. In other words, to be more productive, because the more productive they are, the more pieces they produce, the more pay they're going to get. But also as, as uh, someone who studied uh, everything about how work is done, uh, he actually came up with systems that actually increased the efficiency of workers, um, including how many uh, steps it might take to get certain things done. Um, you know, it's, you know, who really uses this in, in good detail is UPS. UPS uses uh, Frederick Taylor's work um, to a T because in UPS, there's ways 
in which you know time and efficiency is done and it's a it's a company-wide policy which means that everyone's following that uh, and that's really kind of based on Taylor's work but he was really kind of the first one to look at this and again the piece read uh, piece rate system uh, is basically a reward system that the more the more pieces you produce, the more you get paid. Right? So even though a company might expect uh, that every employee would produce 60 pieces of whatever in a particular hour, uh, well, if it's piece rate, there's going to be a number of employees who want to make more than that. And so um the more pieces they put together the more they're earning for that hour and so that's um, that's his motivation not to be outdone a number of different folks uh got involved with studying um how businesses work worker motivation other types of things so uh, the Hawthorne studies uh this is where Mayo comes in again it's very early this is still we are mainly in Factoryville here, um, and uh, factories were were dull, dingy, dirty, dark uh, places, and uh, they, their work environment was not terrific. Uh, so Mayo uh, studied all this type of uh, type of thing and said, "Look, um, there are certain things that we can do to help workers out. One is give them lighting, give them effective lighting." And so that's what they did. One of the tests is he looked at uh, groups of workers, ones that had uh, various uh, degrees of lighting in their in their areas, others that had none, which is typically the way it would it'd be done. You know, it was it was not uh, typical that a lot of factories had, you know, lights all over the place uh, early, early on. Um, and what he noticed is that productivity um basically increased it's a little bit more effective for the folks who had lighting uh than the second group although that's not necessarily what this particular slide gets to um but uh, in essence lighting does help um, appropriately the second step uh is really looking at how effective that piece rate system is um and you know what he said what he saw is actually uh things were pretty constant you know there was a constant amount of output uh regardless and so um they looked at just a standard rate of pay as an easier system uh than a piecemeal system but anyway um but uh, there are a lot of human factors, certainly, that are responsible for what's going on, that are uh, as important, uh, if not, I'm sure he thought, more important than uh, pay rates. And off to Maslow we go, OK? Uh, you know that I needed to do Maslow here. You Sorry about that. Um, so the hierarchy of needs, you've seen this before, um, ranked in importance. It's that wonderful little pyramid here. Uh, and so there's lots of different, you know, um, ways in which businesses look at Maslow's hi hierarchy of needs and decides exactly how they can try to satisfy various uh, types of things. Uh, I think this is in the next slide, yeah. So for the psychological needs, uh, I'm sorry, physiological needs, what we need to survive, right? Businesses thought, well, if we pay people adequate wages, uh, they'll be able to get the things they need to survive. In terms of safety needs, uh, businesses thought, okay, uh, job stability, health insurance, pension plans, working conditions all contribute to an employer, employees feeling of being physically secure and emotionally secure in the workplace. For the social needs, uh, which are really about love and affection in a workplace, it's sort of um, that work environment is, uh, is uh, effective. Um, it's sort of uh, a place where it resembles to some degree 
those social needs that take place in families and, and groups of friends, um, but with a productive end to it. Uh, esteem needs, again, respect, recognition, a sense of accomplishment. Uh, certainly you can uh, praise people and reward people for that. You can also provide promotional opportunities to, uh, to get people to uh, be recognized for that. Uh, and there's a lot of aspects of this issue of respect that management is still working on today, for sure. Uh, Self-actualization needs, again, uh, does the business allow you to grow and to develop and to become more of what you can be, right? So um, perhaps some training and other types of things, certainly promotions are part of that. Uh, Hertzberg, right, had this idea that the idea of, of motivation and hygiene are two very different and distinct dimensions of what mode of, of uh, work. So motivation factors, um, he thought job factors that increase motivation uh, doesn't necessarily mean that if they weren't there, that workers would be dissatisfied. And you'll see that in a moment. The hygiene factors, he thought, um, you know, don't necessarily uh, affect uh, the motivation. Um, so what is he talking about? Well, in this case, the motivational factors regarding around, you know, the work that itself, uh, advancement and recognition and levels of responsibility all provide uh, appropriate means of motivation and uh, can, lead to satisfaction for employees that have many of these types of things uh, available to them uh, or lack of satisfaction if these are not recognized appropriately or uh, motivating forces. In terms of what the business can can do in terms of hygiene, um, you know, these are some more basic types of stuff, your pay, uh, company policies, the working conditions, how your supervisors uh, and your other relationships are at work can lead to, you know, uh, you can be either satisfied or dissatisfied uh, as well. And so he thought that these particular things don't overlap um, and that a lot of other uh, theories were, were mixing the two. Speaking of theories, there's a few that we need to review. Um, theory X, very popular theory, is consistent with Taylor, um, that, you know, basically employees dislike work. You know, they really are, it, it's not necessarily that they're lazy, but they are. <laughs> um, and the best way to, to motivate and keep everyone focused is to have a highly controlled work environment. Okay, so there's a few assumptions to that, right, that people try to avoid work, particularly when they're not getting looked at, right, if you're unsupervised, will you get your work done? Uh, this theory says no, you can avoid it. Um, so managers must coerce and control and threaten, you know, you gotta get this done, it's gotta be done now, blah, 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 um, because employees just simply avoid work and dislike work. And people must be led because in and of itself, there's little ambition or responsibility um, involved there. So this is the theory X. You might've worked in a company that practices the theory X style of, of management. Um, and if you have, you probably know it's not all that pleasant. Um, theory Y is just the opposite. It's just, you know, actually, employees are, uh, they, they, uh, they are very much committed and able to do a lot of different things. Um, and so uh, theory Y, unlike theory X, uh, might uh, agree that people do not naturally, they do not naturally dislike work, that there's actually work that they like doing, you know, um, in, in and of itself for the work. And they'll work towards goals uh, in which they're committed to doing. And so uh, that's important to get employee buy-in, to, to get them committed to various things. 
they become committed when it's very, very clear that accomplishing those goals will bring rewards to them personally. Uh, that might be recognition, that might be, you know, um, promotional opportunities, that might be other types of things like this. Uh, theory Y also assumes that people are very interested in seeking out and accept additional responsibilities because that's part of their desire to be noticed, to have rewards, to have things to do and contribute. Um, employees have a lot of potential. And in general, uh, most organizations don't fully utilize all their human resources. And uh, uh, that's also part of, the, of theory why. So as you see, if you look at this particular table, the area of work compared to how theory X and theory Y plays, play out, uh, this will sort of be a good idea to, um, to look at this and understand the differences between X and Y. But wait, we're not done. Why stop at X and Y when you can also do Z and a bunch of other things, in fact. So let's go to theory Z. Um, so there's actually, uh, there's, there's some mixture. Theory Z is sort of a hybrid uh, type of mixtures between what the, the American system and Japanese systems uh, practices are, are like, okay. Um, it's developed by, uh, by William uh, Ochi. And the emphasis is, you know, let everyone participate as much as possible and within reason in the decision-making process at organizations, because then everyone will have those types of things. So type J is really about traditional uh, Japanese um, management theories um, versus type A here, which is more American. Uh, so in terms of how we visit, how we usually look at things here or the culture of working in firms here is it's short-term employment. You, you know, you can quit or get fired at any time. Uh, Decision-making is individual, uh, responsibility is individual. Uh, there's rapid promotion for those that do well. Uh, there are control mechanisms in place, specialized career paths and uh, concern for employees are segmented depending on who they are. Um, or just parts of what the issues are. For uh, Japanese culture, it works differently in their firms. When, when a Japanese firm hires you, it's lifetime employment. Uh, of course, the word lifetime only means 55, but, <laughs> but it is uh, considered a lifetime employment. They don't, you have a job for life with them. Uh, Decision-making is a group process, it's collective. So is the responsibility to get everything done. It's a group process, which is what collective is. Um, it's slow. Promotion opportunities are, are few and far between. It's a very slow process. Um, the group uh, is, in essence, by you having certain things that you normally do. There's some implied control mechanisms that are already built in. Uh, career paths are not as spe specialized as in the United States. Um, it's a bit different. And the employee is looked at in terms of, of holistic, not just uh, a portion of the need or a portion, it's the whole person is involved. Um, so there are your A and J, right? American firms, Japanese firms. Well, theory uh, type Z or theory Z is looking at the best choice, right? Long-term employment, um, group decision-making, collective decision-making, get everybody involved, as many people involved in the process. Uh, but it's okay to have individual responsibility. Um, promotions are probably gonna be a little bit slower in this model. Uh, control is more informal. Uh, there are specialized career paths, but they're simply modified from, uh, they're combined. And uh, companies have to have that whole view of the employee in order to do quite well and to understand them. Oop, I'm just tapping away here. Um, next we have uh, reinforcement theory, okay? So reinforcement theory basically is rewarded behavior. Right? Um, so when you reward certain behavior, it's gonna be repeated, uh, where in the negative, it, it, you're trying to punish it so it doesn't repeat. 
So uh, there's both uh, positive and negative reinforcement as, as listed here on this particular slide, uh, because you are looking to reward behavior um, in one end where the other is you want to eliminate behavior, certain behaviors on the other end. Um, and so that's, that's very important with enforcement theory, okay? Um, the idea is uh, in many cases for the negative reinforcement, there's usually some type of punishment for doing certain things to help you understand that this is undesirable behavior or actions. Um, and so <clears throat> that's part of reinforcement theory here. Uh, equity theory looks at people are motivated when they see equitable treatment uh, for themselves among, and, and others. And so, uh, and this is of course, one of the really big topics uh, in, in work today because um, uh, of societal inequities, they, they, they come into work, you know, I mean, whatever inequities we have in society, uh, all, all, all of us are working together in a workplace. And so there's gonna be inequities in the workplace. Um, but it's nice to know that in this particular theory, that um, there's, there's some degree of employee contribution uh, to the organization, what you think matters, uh, because there's more equitable treatment among everyone in the process of, of working. Okay. Um, so your, your book goes into lots of different issues in terms of equity theory that uh, that I'll let you kind of read through a little bit. It's more of understanding what the basic things are that's really important. Expectancy theory really is about what you would expect to happen and did it happen, right? So, you know, how much we want something and how likely we are to get it. Um, and so if you're expecting that if you work really hard and you're gonna get a pay raise, um, then that's basically motivating your actions. What happens when you don't get that? Well, then there goes your, your motivation, right? Or what happens when not only do you get a, a raise, but you get a much bigger raise than you thought you were gonna get? Woo, boy, your motivation's through the roof. You might as well just fly to the moon and back. So that's a big part of expectancy theory. Uh, it was uh, developed by uh, Victor Vroom, Room, 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 uh, and basically, it's it's quite complex because, you know, there there's several possible outcomes in terms of what we want, what we don't want, um, or what we expect, or what we're not expecting. But you know, um, the theory basically comes down to this model here. You know, what does the person does the person want the outcome to happen? And so if the answer is yes, then the issue is, okay, if you want this to happen, do you think it's going to happen? Do you think it's likely going to happen? The answer is yes, you are motivated to go, ready to roll. Uh, if at any point in time you don't want it, there's no motivation, or you want it, but you don't think it's going to be able to get done because of maybe the structure in the workplace or there's no encouragement for that, et cetera. Uh, you're not going to get motivated. Uh, but if you do, boom, you're in luck. You're, you will stay motivated. Another theory um, is something called goal setting theory. And that's basically managers or employees uh, sitting down together, establishing those goals. Because then employees have a say on what the goals are, and thus they're motivated to get that stuff done because they had a say in it. So, um, so again, it's, it's, it's a little bit challenging, but uh, it's still looking at, you know, if the goal is achieved, it's because we did it, right? because we all had to say in it, we did it. Um, another theory that you need to understand is something called uh, management by objective, okay? And basically speaking, it is really about that collaboration and goal setting. Uh, but it helps to clarify the roles for employees in order to get those goals done, okay? Um, one thing that MBO, as they call it, really does help with 
is because employees are collaborating in the setting of goals, the organization offers and empowers them with that active role. And that empowerment means you have some say in the decision making, right? So you feel like your thoughts, your input really matters and that increases your motivation quite a bit. But in order for this to happen, your top managers have to feel, you know, not threatened by all of this stuff because what if you think differently than what they, they were thinking? Um, and so it's really important that uh, top managers are comfortable with all of this collaboration. If they're not comfortable with that collaboration, it usually doesn't happen. It usually doesn't happen. They're gonna to make the decisions and do those things themselves. So they're not gonna kind of ask employees to help set the goals. They'll set the goals and tell the employees. And it goes over the steps here that is really something you could read about quickly. Um, the issue of job enrich enrichment, basically, you know, how do you keep someone motivated who's been doing this particular job? Well, maybe more variety uh, within the job is going to help keep uh, people motivated. Maybe a little bit more responsibility for that type of job might help, though this is new and, and I'm motivated to learn it, etc. So it might be a motivation technique for some employees. Um, Job enlargement is really sort of about uh, including additional but very similar tasks. So in essence, their job was larger than it was before in terms of that addition or uh, additional assignments um, will simply make that person a little bit more influential in getting things done in the department or in the area. Or specifically redesign the job, restructure it so your uh, what your worker can do is matched up to the job and and thus you know that gives a lot of satisfaction a lot of motivation to come and do that job it's almost designed for your your benefit uh, one thing that is also used for reinforcement is a concept in psychology as you might have heard before called behavior modification right. and uh, behavior modification really wants uh, employees to, to do certain types of behavior um, and to learn how to do certain types of behavior. And so how do they learn it? Well, there's some rewards, there's some punishments to help uh, make sure that the behavior is, uh, is what the company is looking for, right? Because they feel it's more effective, okay? And again, uh, the steps are outlined here um, that you can look through. Flex time is the idea that employees can actually set their own hours. There's usually some limits. Um, and so, for example, instead of working nine to five or eight to four, um, the company that has flex time would say, look, you can structure your hours anytime between seven o'clock in the morning and six o'clock at night. And so that means some people that like getting up early can work from seven to three. Right? Some people that prefer the nine to five can work nine to five. Some people like to sleep late, they wanna work 10 to six. So the flex time allows that uh, employees to set their own working hours uh, within what is reasonable limits that the employer actually needs employees for to get things done. Right? Not everyone can come in late or everyone can go in early and leave early. Uh, there's work that has to get done. So there's got to be certain limits. But in essence, that employees actually set their own work time is great. And then, of course, there's something called a compressed work week where, you know, instead of working five days a week uh, for eight hours a day for a 40 hour work week, can you work four hour, uh, 10 hours for four days? And that's your 40 hours. Or can you work 12 hours a day for three days? And that's your 40 hours, which is what happens for a lot of nurses and other types of things. That's basically what they do for a schedule. But that's a compressed work week. And a lot of employers feel that might motivate people because they have a little extra time off to do other types of things. Um, and they want to get the job done. Um, Part-time work is really about permanent employment, but the hours are less than a standard 40 hours or 36 hours, whatever the full-time limit is for that company. Um, 
and a lot of people uh, are very satisfied just doing part-time work, you know, and uh, and that is why those are designed uh, for those types of folks. And then, of course, there are there's job sharing, uh, which is one full-time position, but it's broken. It's done by two people. Uh, on a different, on a rotating basis. And so it's a one full-time 40 hour position, but two people do it. Maybe they both take 20 hours a week each to do that one particular job. Um, and again, and there's advantages and disadvantages to all of these types of, of systems. Um, but again, um, it, it is so, somewhat meant to help motivate and help uh, companies have that increased output from employees. Another um, function or other thing they can do is do telecommuting, which is what this is right now. It's basically working from home. Um, you can work from home either all the time or for a portion of the week uh, because it allows a lot of flexibility for the employee. Um, and it actually helps to save a few things uh, for employers in terms of rent uh, and travel costs, uh, morale is usually better um, when you have this type of thing. And so, you know, employees feel very good about it. Sometimes it can lead, as it says, to feelings of isolation and you're, you're distracted at home. I actually thought I would be very distracted working at home because um, it was always hard for me to work at home. But actually, since all this started, I've been doing, uh, surprisingly, I enjoy it a lot more than I thought I did. Um, employee empowerment is actually uh, asking employees or giving employees uh, participation in decision making process uh, in the company. And that takes place in a number of different ways. Certainly, we talked earlier about how employees are being asked to participate in uh, goal setting and, and those types of decisions. You can also empower employees to make certain decisions on the job to help clients or others get things done. And so, you know, part of it is this is hard to do. You don't want to give everybody sort of a blanket decision making power. Uh, there are some limits. And so managers usually do set those limits. They set expectations, they set standards, uh, et cetera. And so, uh, but it does allow employees to feel as though they have more at stake and thus more motivation to be there. Another way to motivate employees is to give them ownership, give them stock ownership in the company. Um, and so that's really, really important. You know, stock options for employee benefits uh, means employees are part owners in the company. If you're an owner in the company, you're going to be motivated to do well because if the company does well, you're part owner, you're also going to do well. So uh, this is how that works in general. And the last thing this chapter talks about is really about employees working together as a team. Um, and the really thing, the big thing about the team is yeah, two or more workers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but again, it's in, it has to be to establish something whatever the goal or the task is. Teams are meant to focus uh, people to work together to get a specific task done or to meet a certain goal of the, of the company. And so um, companies have a lots of different types of teams that they put together. Some that are working on a very specific problem like a problem solving team. Um, some companies actually group employees together and give them their own authority to manage themselves. This is how Apple did a lot of things. When, if you look at early days in Apple, even now, the way Steve Jobs saw it is if you hire the best people to get this done, they manage themselves. Uh, they know exactly what to do. You put a group of them together, they know exactly what needs to get done to get this computer done. Um, and that's the model that Apple used, and it was highly effective for them. You could also use a cross-function team. And so when you need to get something done, but you need lots of different expertise from different areas of the company and different skills to get it done, then you'll have a, a cross-functional 
team. So someone, the function, someone from finance, someone from marketing, someone from engineering, someone from other areas, another function of the business. Um, and of course, virtual teams are uh, geographically anywhere uh, in the world these days, anywhere in the world, it's a global economy. Um, and they communicate electronically, but they're still working to accomplish a goal. They're still a team. They're working together, except they're working uh, together virtually. And a lot of us are doing that these days. Um, your book then talks a little bit about <clears throat> that self-managed teams have both advantages and disadvantages to them. Uh, the biggest disadvantage is really about conflict uh, and who is, who's, who steps up to a leadership role on those teams. Because uh, you need to have you need to have a leader, um, but conflict is often inevitable. Um, and so, in terms of the stages of how teams are developed. Uh, you form a team, right? The team uh, basically starts storming uh, in terms of idea generation, goals and objectives are developed uh, to get things done. And then they have to come to a situation where it's called norming, where they basically start recognizing and understanding what everyone needs to get done. Um, and so those are norms, right? And then you got to perform. The performance has got to be dynamic uh, and it's got to get the job done. Once the goal is accomplished, then you can adjourn. Um, the team can come to a, a close. Uh, there might be something recorded as to what worked, what didn't work. So the next team can learn from it. But in essence, um, those are some of the stages. Okay. And then your book talks a little bit about some roles. Um, within a team. And again, you certainly need specialists to get things done, uh, but certainly you need to have a supportive and encouraging uh, group of members because it's that encouragement and support that makes um, those teams rise to the, the occasion. I mean, look at all the teams that were put together just to, to try to put together a vaccine for COVID. These, this is all team work. And imagine how difficult it was to, you know, to be part of that particular team, knowing you have all that pressure to get all this stuff done, but you got to work with everybody. So you have to support each other because you're all in it together. Um, dual roles are, are both of those. And then there are some members of the team that basically are um, are not a non-participant. You know, they they do not contribute, and they do not provide input. Um, and that's unfortunate. We all know that there's some folks that we have been parts of teams on that they just they don't do anything. They don't care to do anything. Um, and then of course the idea of cohesion is you know sticking together. There's many studies about ideal team sizes. Um, so this is really from a business perspective, although it might be seeming these days that the Jets might be doing better with five players rather than 12, um, or there'd be no change in the scores at the end of the day, perhaps. Um, but you know, one way to kind of get this type of stuff done is there's gonna be a certain amount of people. Uh, the larger that team becomes, the more complicated things get. Uh, and you really need to focus on the goal at hand, right? And, you know, part of a, a way to actually come together as a team is with competition with other teams, because then you sort of have to work together to get things done. And you might see that on some shows, whether it's, I don't know, it's The Great Escape or, you know, some of the other shows that are on TV that are basically they're small, short, small teams, but there's competition with other teams and they, they're forced to work together or the team dissolves, right? Survivor, things like that. Um, and then of course, you know, uh, you have to make sure that there's enough feedback. Sometimes that's a formal appraisal from someone on the outside uh, who makes the team feel that they're actually doing those things together and they'll stay doing it well and, and they feel they're, they're part of a team. They feel that they're part of a team. Um, and of course, that frequent interaction um, 
sort of helps people get used to each other to, to a large degree. Uh, and of course, your book goes over just like any other uh, ways in which things are, are happening. Uh, forming a team and using teams for work has both benefits and some limitations to it. And that, my friends, is the review of chapter 10. Questions?